everybody, it's Annie here from the education team. Um, very exciting going live down here at our Marmoset house. Um, as always, we're going to kind of give it a few minutes because no doubt there'll be people kind of jumping in in the next couple of minutes. Um, but we're going to do a short kind of homeschooling lesson for you down here. Uh, talk to you more about the Marmosets that are behind me. Um, hopefully we're going to have some of the guys appearing around me. Um, I've got Charlie behind the camera who uh, will be fielding any questions and passing them over to me. Um, and she'll interrupt me to make sure that any of your questions get asked and so we can answer them for you. Um, like I said, we'll just give it a couple of minutes because no doubt there's a few people uh, joining in. Um, but yeah, make sure that if you've got any questions you want to ask about the marmosets that I'm going to talk about today, please do type them in so we can answer them. Um, also, if you have any questions at all about the park and primates, we'll, uh, we'll field them for you as well. But if you've got little ones with you who you're homeschooling, um, get them involved, get them on and listening to us um, and hope to just have a short kind of burst of a bit of science and nature so we can talk more about the marmosets at the park. Yeah, guys, do let us know. Sorry, this is Charlie. I'm hiding behind the camera today, which is very nice. But do let us know that you can hear Annie clearly as well, because we're obviously having to stand a bit of a distance from each other. Um, so let us know that you can hear us and see us all OK and that everything's working all right as well. Um, I'll be uh, trying to pass your questions over to Annie and feed them over to her. And we'll try and see some of the guys behind her as well, which is uh, Ruby and Oscar's group with their youngsters in there. But we will walk around the whole domestic complex and see them. Um, if you haven't seen already on the Facebook page this morning, we posted the worksheets that Annie's put up and put together. And we've also got them on our website as well on under learning resources. So do go and uh, have a look there. People are starting to come in now, Annie. It's really good. Excellent. That's cool. Hi, Amber. Hi, Holly. Hi, Sinead. Hello. hello. <laughs> Amber wants to know how are you all coping with lockdown? We're coping all right. Um, sadly, we're all a bit used to it now, aren't we? Um, so the park is closed. Uh, we've been closed for a couple of weeks now because we did close uh, around the Christmas period. Um, normally, it's a bit of a quieter time of year for Monkey World anyway. Um, but it's just really strange to not have you all coming to visit the park uh, and see the fabulous primates that are around. I've actually got a couple of the marmosets being lovely and obliging and being behind me at the moment. But we, we're coping all right, but we're yeah, loving having uh, contact with you over Facebook and social media. Um, yeah, it's lovely to hear what you guys are up to and have your questions. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a funny old time, but we're getting through it, definitely. Great, everyone's coming in so we can hear us both well, so that's good to know. So, and, oh, and stars are coming, starting to come in as well. Thank you very much for those, that's very appreciated. Um, so we'll get started with our lesson, if that's all right, Annie, if you want to start telling us a little bit about the worksheets we've put up today and who we're in front of. Excellent, yeah, so we're trying to put some more resources up for you guys who are homeschooling, and we've put a few worksheets up. Uh, first of all, starting us off with some designing and enclosure activities, and one of them is based on marmosets. Um, so have a look on our Facebook page and our website for those uh, resources. So we thought we'd do a short lesson just to tell you more about these monkeys, so you have a bit more knowledge, so then you can go off and do those worksheets, and do send them to us if you want us to have a look, if you've got any photos, videos, drawings, anything that you've done as a result of our lesson, please do send them to us at education at monkeyworld.org and we'll have a look and see what you guys have been up to. Um, so we're down here at the Marmoset house. Um, we've got several Marmoset enclosures around Monkey World and this is the one that we call our domestic Marmoset complex. So Marmosets are small monkeys that come from Brazil in South America um, and they are a really, really interesting species that sadly we have a lot of here at Monkey World. As you guys know, we are a rescue centre. So the animals that come and live with us here at the park are primates that have been kept um, as pets or in entertainment. Um, but with marmosets, we really are talking about the UK pet trade. Um, marmosets at the moment can be bought and sold legally in the UK with no licensing whatsoever. And so it means we get asked on almost a daily basis if we can rehome marmosets at the park. And that's what our, our worksheet is all about this time. We've given you a hypothetical situation. If you were tasked with building a new marmoset house here at Monkey World for a newly rescued group of marmosets, what would you build? Why would you build it? And what would you make sure was in it for a marmoset so they had all of their needs covered? So you can see some of the enclosures behind me. We've got our lovely big outside enclosures. Uh, we've got one of the marmosets up in the tunnel up here. This is Ruby and Oscar's family that are behind us. A couple of them are in the window. I'm not sure if you can see it at the moment. But because they are quite small monkeys, 
our enclosures are smaller than say our enclosures for the chimpanzees because chimps live in these massive groups. Here at Monkey World we have about 18 is our biggest group of chimps, whereas our marmosets we live, tend to keep in pairs or small family groups. Uh, Ruby and Oscar's family behind us is our biggest group of marmosets because there's six of them living in this enclosure together because it's mum and dad and four kids. Now in the wild marmosets would live in their family groups. They might live in groups with up to about 20 members all living together but our families tend to be on the smaller side here at the park. Where they've come from the UK pet trade, they're often kept on their own in really, really small cages, tiny little bird cages with nothing to climb, nowhere to go, and often kept on their own. So when they come to Monkey World, quite a lot of them don't have any social skills. They don't know how to live and behave with each other. So it's easier for them to live in smaller groups that our keepers manage and look after on a daily basis. Now, one of the things we always get asked is what do our monkeys eat? So people often ask me when we go to schools um, and we do lessons, do monkeys really eat bananas? Uh, yeah, they do eat bananas and they do like fruit. But these marmosets have a really, really special diet that most people don't know, re don't recognise. Now, most of us know what a carnivore is, which is an animal that only eats meat, uh, or a herbivore, an animal that only eats plants. But marmosets are gummivores, which is a word that most of us haven't come across unless you're learning more about specialist animals like marmosets. Now, gummivore actually means that these guys eat the gum or tree sap that's hidden underneath the bark in trees. So these guys are specially adapted to get, I can hear them chatting behind me and I can't help but turn around and look at them. But it's nice to know they're actually there and I'm not stood behind an empty enclosure. Um, so they have these specialised teeth, their teeth are adapted to scrape the bark off of trees and then they can use their tongue to lick up all of the sticky sap and tree gum, which makes up a really big part of their diet. So our keepers here actually feed them gum which is made up from a special powder that you mix with a little bit of water and so it makes up that gum-like -like, gum substance and then they hide it around the enclosures and specialist feeders that we've made so they can simulate those natural behaviours and forage and look for their food like they would in the wild. I don't know if you can see any gum feeders behind us at the moment, but often it's kind of slices of logs that the keepers drill holes into so they can pour the gum in and then the marmosets have to come and find it. And they can use those teeth to gouge into their holes and it'd be more like their natural diet for them. Um, they do also get given live insects, um, as well as some bits of fruit and veg, but often when they're kept as pets, people will give them a diet completely made up of fruit, which is way too much sugar for these really small monkeys. So it's really, really important that we make sure that they have a good, healthy, appropriate diet when they come to us here at Monkey World. Uh, they also have specially adapted nails. So primates have fingernails rather than claws. It's one of the characteristics, if you did our home education course earlier on in the year, that you've probably learnt about that primates have fingernails but these guys their nails are specially adapted so they are more claw-like so they can grip onto the bark on trees so they can climb up it and then have a really good hold on the trees when they're scraping the bark off to get all of that sticky gum so in their enclosures what else have we got we've got some so of course at monkey world if you've been here before you'll know that some enclosures have lots of trees in them, some have climbing frames. It depends a little bit on where the enclosure is at the park and what primates we're keeping in them. So these guys, we've got some plants, lovely natural real plants and bushes in there, but because they've got a roof on them, we can't have massive really tall trees in here. So what our keepers will do is when we're clearing off um, branches, when we're um, trimming back some of the trees that are hanging over, uh, over fences, um, we'll use the branches, they're cable tied in, so there's lots of places for the guys to travel around and walk through their enclosure. So they can go to different levels and different heights. We've also got fab things like these hanging bits of log. When it's sunny, it's not so sunny now, but thank goodness it's not raining <laughs> like it was earlier. I'm much happier that it's, it's dry. They like to sit on those logs and bask in the sunlight. If you've ever seen uh, Brass and Evie, our hybrid marmosets, they really love it when it's hot and it's sunny. They'll come out, find a sunny perch uh, and sit up there. We've got someone who's just kind of, they're, they're, they're braving it. They're coming out to see what we're up to. They came out a moment ago to see what we were doing and then I think realised that we weren't being all that exciting and, and went back in. 
but you can see the tunnels that we've got that link the outside enclosures to their inside areas. Now on your worksheets you'll see that there's some enclosure basics on there. So those are the things that all of, our, all of your enclosure designs should have as a minimum. And I'm going to double check because I've got my worksheets with me. I've also got our fabulous education packs which are still available online if you are doing some primate related work. If you're still doing our, going to go back and have a look at our home education course that we did earlier in the year, it's a fab resource to use. It's got so much information in there about the primates at the park. Um, and there's also workbooks that you can buy as well, which come from Key Stage 1, 2 and 3. Yeah, those are really great, not only for project learning, but for, they do link into the curriculum as well, don't they, Annie, with the science, maths, every, yeah, a little bit of everything on there. It. So they were designed a couple of years ago now, but fully to be curriculum linked. So if you're doing things like animals, including humans, um, there's some great resources and information. It might be really good for parents to kind of look at and take away, whether you're doing our home education course or just to help your, your little ones at home to get a bit more information, do some more interesting stuff whilst they're at home. Having a lovely play around behind yeah, us as we're chatting. They keep coming over and peeking and seeing what we're up to. Shall we do some questions quickly? People yeah, are just starting to... To come in so let me just go back um hopefully there's one person said that we, they couldn't hear us very well but i'm hoping everyone else can so just send mm. us a thumbs up and send it through yeah, if you can it. still hear annie we will put this up later and it will also have subtitles on it too so hopefully if you can't quite catch everything we're saying right now you will be able to catch up on it later um one second let me scroll right back because everyone's been coming in it's good when she has to go all the way back because it means there's lots of questions yeah, to go through that's lots it. of people listening and lots of people are sending stars as well. They've sent, oh, thank you. Lots of likes coming in so you can hear us. Oh, okay, amazing. good. Thank you, guys. Um, 800 stars. That equates to like eight pounds for us, which is great for... That's amazing. Thank you so yeah. much. It's, yeah, every, every little helps with the park not being open at the moment. So thank you so much uh, for sending those stars in. Um, okay, Carol wants to know, how do the marmosets deal with the cold? I'm just skipping to mainly the marmoset questions today, guys. So um, we will try and deal with some of the others later. But yeah, the marmosets, while we've got time, we'll, we'll try and stick with those questions. So yeah, Carol, how do the marmosets deal with the cold, Annie? So like the rest of the primates at the park, they can come outside during the winter. The gates are open for them unless the primate care staff are in the enclosure um, and doing some work, doing some renovations or putting food in there for them or cleaning up. Um, but they can always go inside and at this time of year when it is cold because they are from hot climates uh, in South America our houses are heated to it's normally around mid-twenties which is why if you've ever come to Funky World and worry, wondered why keepers are walking around in shorts in January it's because they're in and out of houses that are really really warm we also make sure that they've got lots of um, lots and lots of warm bedding so the marmosets we use really nice fleecy blankets we put them inside um, like nest boxes and baskets for them, lots of wood wool that really keeps them warm and insulated um, and perhaps during the winter it's when they might get a little bit more kind of warm food in their diet. Most of you have probably seen the primates having ice related treats, ice lollies and things um, in the summer and we'll go the other way and give them some warmer bits of food in the winter as well. But as you can see they are still coming out and about. Um, of course most of these guys have been born here in the UK as part of the UK pet trade so they are acclimatised uh, to life in the UK, but like us in January, they're just wanting to spend a bit more time indoors where it's nice and warm. Ah, thank you. So Jenny, who sent stars, thank you very much, Jenny. Uh, Jenny wants to know how many do we have here now? Well, so how many marmosets do we have here now? So it's, it's in the high 30s of the common marmosets. You're testing me now on my numbers and we'll have the small monkey team, I'm sure, will be, go will, uh, will be screaming at me the numbers that we have. I think it's around 35. 35. I'm going to put, stick my neck out there and say. Common marmosets. Marmosets. Or just marmosets in general. Um, so we also have a couple of tamarins and a group of squirrel monkeys, um, some of which have come from the UK pet trade. Um, but our small monkey section is the one that grows the most because we're constantly being asked to take in more and more pet marmosets, um, pet small monkeys from the UK. Um, at the moment, we have a waiting list of, it's around 100 at the moment, isn't it, Charlie? It's actually more than that. It's, it's almost 160, I think, at wow. the moment. It's grown hugely during 2020 in our lockdown, which is why we, um, we're so keen for people to go onto the public consultation that's on the government at the moment and do have your say about it and say something about it because uh, we need to sort of stem the flow of they, these animals coming into the pet trade. So super, super important if you can. Yeah, Those guys are having a lovely play behind you, Annie. Yeah, thank you so much, guys. 
<laughs> um, Chelsea's little boy Logan is joining today. Hi, Logan. Hi, Logan. Uh, and happy birthday for 11 days time when you'll be seven. I'm glad to hear you've got the worksheets ready. Hopefully we'll be answering your questions. Let me scroll on through. Another Jen's asked how many Mama's Zets we've had. We've had that one. All these people sending stars, which is great. Thank you so much. Mm. I'm watching Charlie's face as she scrolls, scrolls through and try because they'll just keep moving as well as questions come in. And there, I'm trying to multitask. Uh, <laughs> Amber wants to know what their favourite things to eat are, but we've kind of discussed that with the gum, haven't we? Yeah, so their gum is a big part of their diet. They really enjoy the live insects as well because, um, yeah, they'll have a really good forage for them. Um, and one kind of mealworm or waxworm um, is, a, is like a three course meal almost for them. Remember, that was how uh, Michael has described it to me when you see them find an insect. So, yeah, they love the insects. They love, uh, they love the odd little bit of sweet food as well, a little bit of nice sweet fruit. Um, but, yeah, the gum is their, their really big part of their diet and really important for them. And yeah, on that, I'd like to say a big thank you to everyone who sent us insects through our Amazon wish list. Wow, all these stars keep coming in, that's amazing. Um, thank you so much for all those donations. We do go through masses of insects, so anything that um, we tend to put them on our Amazon wish list quite a lot. If you can help, that's great. Um, we do appreciate it. It's, it's tough for everyone at the moment, but uh, it's really fantastic if people can help us. Uh, Di wants to know who is the enclosure behind us. Yeah, it's Ruby. Yeah, you're right. Ruby and Oscar. Ruby and Oscar and the kids. It's the kids, I think, who have mostly been uh, appearing behind us. Uh, and Sue wants to know, do the Marmoset socialise with other Marmoset families in the outside enclosures? That's a really good question. So if you've been to Monkey World, um, there's lots of noises that you'll hear. Uh, you, might, you might be able to hear a bit of road noise, which is far less exciting. But you can often hear the primates kind of keeping in contact with each other uh, between the enclosures. With the marmosets, the most easy to recognise noi uh, recognise noise, I'm not sure that English is, <laughs> um, is their contact call. So that's the really high pitched, kind of long, it's kind of like a squeak. Um, and so you will hear them make that lovely long call and you can hear them respond from other enclosures as well. Um, and the same goes for the other primates at the park as well. When the gibbons are singing in the morning, talking to each other, um, you can hear when a, one chimp group starts to alarm call, actually the other across the way will start to respond as well. So there's definitely conversation uh, and communication that goes on between them. Um, if you have a look at our home education course that's on the website, there's a whole uh, lesson and resources page uh, about communication and senses in primates. So there's more about it in there. So should we wander along and see some of the houses, Annie, yeah, while we're, fabulous, while we're fabulous. here? Might as well show you some of the... Um... You might see some of the guys' uh, faces at the windows um, where they've been very sensible and staying indoors. So we'll have a look and see what else we can spot. So on both, we've got enclosures on both sides because we've got the tunnels that go along the top and into further outside enclosures. Um, so each of the small groups has their own indoor space and outdoor space. Um, for you, when you're start designing your enclosures, one of the things that's a bit different about our marmoset enclosures is that the mesh on the enclosures is much more fine because of course if we had big gaps, someone small like a marmoset could just toddle straight out. So it's a slightly different material that we use and I think there's some extended activities in there um, where if you want to talk about what materials you would use, you can go into that as well. So we've got a pair just sat here at the window having a good watch seeing what's going on so we've also um, did you want to go and stand next to them yeah, can, sure. as it's by the window we're if they stay there that's it. i'm trying to keep my distance of course a bit more than um than we previously would um because i'm by the window it's all right with me talking without my mask on we just have to be of course more cautious of standing closer to the primates when they're out and about um so we've got a couple of the guys just sat here um, this is where my marmoset knowledge is really tested and I have to admit I'm not very good at knowing all of the marmosets by name um, so unless Charlie's gonna be wonderful and tell me she's, put, she's quietly shaking her head <laughs> again primate care staff will be watching this back and telling me who it was um, so all of the guys have these windows so they can look out and yeah this time of year this is where you see them sat in the windows watching the world go by popping into the tunnels um, but yeah staying nicely in their lovely warm houses okay i'll go back through because there's still some more questions that we haven't quite got Fabulous. to yet so just bear with me guys while i am um, just watch annie's lovely face while i'm just finding the <laughs> questions again because a lots have come in really appreciate that and there was a great one I saw a second look ago. At the that's that's <laughs> more exciting than me. But uh, there's a few of the guys in the tunnel above Charlie now, kind of having a look. 
you could just hear their you feet hear going them. up and down. Um, something that I always find really funny when we have school groups in the park to tell them is to ask them why um, the tunnels that go over the path, why do they have a solid metal bottom on them? Um, it's because the marmosets wee all the time. They're scent marking all the time, so they, uh, it's basically there so you don't get weed on whilst, uh, whilst you're trying to enjoy your night. It's very kind of us, isn't it? Yeah, I we think we are yeah. very good to it, absolutely. <laughs> um, Anne-Marie has asked a really interesting question. Mm. Ah, that's just disappeared because Louise has sent some lovely stars. Thank you. Oh, About um, the gist of it was, do we have any kind of... Um, any marmosets with special requirements? So do we have any deaf or blind or, or ones with any impairments as such? Oh, that's a really good question. And so when we do rescue these guys from the pet trade, they do come with a whole host of physical problems and psychological problems. So problems with their mental health as well as their physical health. Um, so the pair that immediately come to mind that I think have the most kind of um, extra requirements uh, that I can think of are Brass and Evy, um, who I mentioned earlier are, uh, are unknown marmosets or hybrid marmosets. Di's actually asked how they are as well, so that's really oh, nice. amazing, lovely. Yeah. Well, they're getting on really, really well. They're happy with each other as ever. Um, but where they were crossbred, um, they've actually got, particularly underneath their bellies, they haven't got any of that lovely thick hair. They've got lots of patches around their ears and heads where, um, where you can see their, their very fair skin. Um, so they're quite susceptible to things like sunburn and getting out in the heat. So if our keepers can, they will actually try and get like a little bit of sun cream onto some of those primates. Um, happens with some of our stump-tailed macaques, I believe, um, and also one of our chimps. So, but when they come, quite often they have problems with their mobility because they've been kept in small cages where they haven't been able to climb. Their muscles are really weak. Some of them have nutritional bone disease or rickets. So we have to work to make sure that their diet is really good. They're getting all of those vitamins and nutrients into them. And really importantly, that they can go outside because we get vitamin D3 from being out in the sunlight. It's not really sunny today, but being out in the sun, it make, we absorb that vitamin and it makes our bones nice and strong. So often as time goes on, we can correct things like the rickets and those problems, but they do often come to us with, with lots of problems that we need to rectify for them. Fabulous. Just looking, there's um, some people, Sue, Zena, thank you so much. They've said they've been online and had their say on the Gov website. So it's Jacqueline, that's amazing. Thank you so much, guys. We really appreciate you getting in and having your say. Yeah. We, will put, um, we will put on some, the link to this as well, but if you go on the gov.uk site and just type into public consultations, primates as pets, you will find it. And it's on our website as well. Um, Rachel says, my little boy Billy would like to know how are they such good jumpers? Oh, hi Billy. Thank you for that question. It's fabulous. So they have specially adapted hips and legs so they can really kind of jump and get a good distance. Um, so unlike us, we're not very good at jumping. Some of us are quite good at jumping, but these guys are specially adapted for it. So it's they're in their hips, their joints, they've got a real kind of good bend and strong muscles so they can jump from tree to tree. Where they're only quite little, of course in the wild, hi, in South America, they'll kind of use branches that are kind of interconnect and weave together so they can run across them, but they do sometimes have to make that nice big jump so they have to be adapted to their environment so they can jump. So yeah, fabulous, well done for making that, making a good observation that they are such good jumpers. I've got someone really looking at me now, which I can't, I can't take my eyes off. <laughs> uh, Helen has asked, how are the marmosets at puzzle solving and do they ever have enrichment where they have to work out how to get at their food? That's an interesting one, isn't it? Because uh, they're not quite as intelligent as some of our other monkey species. That's it, because when we think about primates, we think about them all being really clever and they are very intelligent compared to a lot of animals. Because um, primates have bigger brains compared to their body size um, than other mammals, which is what makes them so, so intelligent. But on the kind of the scale of how intelligent primates are, you've got the great apes, chimps, orangutans, gorillas. They're super, super intelligent and really good at problem solving. And the monkeys are just that little bit less intelligent, little bit less good um, at problem solving. Um, but there are some who are fantastic at it, like the capuchins, um, who we always joke are like chimps in monkey costumes because they're so, so smart, so good at solving puzzles. Uh, the Marvin Zets are pretty good at it. Um, they're not, let's say, at capuchin level, but um, our keepers will give them things like the ball pit balls, which I know some of you have donated, which are always gratefully received. Um, and they'll do things like inject them uh, with maybe a bit of juice, a bit of jelly, um, maybe something like honey. Um, so the animals have to try and work out how to get inside those balls to get the food out. Um, you'll see there's these kind of like 
they're kind of cylindrical like structures that have got lots of holes in them that keepers will also stuff lots of the wood wool, the bedding into and maybe put bits of dry food or even the live insects in there. So the animals have to use their brains and have to think about pulling that, that, that stuffing, that wood wool out so they can get to the food inside. Because of course in the wild, they wouldn't have people coming and feeding them. They wouldn't get their food put in one particular place and just come and find it. They really have to think about where their food is coming from. And if it is a bit harder to reach, how are they going to get it out? So that's a fabulous question. And our keepers are always coming up with new ideas of how to keep those brains whirring um, and new interesting ways to give them their food. Fabulous. Thank you so much for the stars that have come in. We've been now up to like 12,000. That's incredible. Amazing. Thank you. Thank um, you. Kerry and Layla have asked, do the marmosets dig or swim? Do the marmosets dig or swim? We can have a little wonder as well. So as far as I know, they're not good diggers or good swimmers. Um, most monkeys don't swim. Most monkeys don't really like going in the water. Hi. Um, that's not true for all of them. Um, macaques do swim in the wild. Um, there's a few different species that will kind of swim to cross a river. Um, people quite often know about the Japanese macaques who sit in the hot springs in Japanese mountains. Um, but I don't think they really do dig very much. They, they probably could, but because they're adapted to live in the trees, it's rare that they would come down to the ground and actually need to think about digging a hole. They'd be more likely to go up and try and get into bark with those specialised teeth to get at the gum that we talked about. But yeah, I don't think marmosets would like it particularly if they had something to swim in. Um, yeah, it's, who knows? It might be something that I'm corrected on, but I don't think we could say that they are good diggers or good swimmers. Um, and Shelley says, hello, my son Josh would like to know how they can move so fast. Thank you for tuning in, guys. Hi, Shelley and Josh. How can they move so fast? Well, I suppose they are very light. They don't weigh very much. Our marmosets on average weigh about 450 grams. Um, so they're really quite small. But like I said, for their size, they've got strong muscles. Um, so they can kind of power along really quickly. And those, claw those nails that adapted to be more claw-like, they can grip really easily and really get some speed up. Um, I think it's fair to say they're much quicker than I am, I think, if, uh, if it was ever measured. <laughs> Have. Now we've had a few questions about how old they are. Amber wants to know how old Ruby and Oscar and the kids are and then other people have asked um, how old they are, what's the maximum age. Sue wants to know what's the maximum age they live to so can you give us some info about that? Yeah cool, so marmosets on average live to about 12 years. Um, like any life expectancy some can live longer, some can live a bit shorter. Um, so I think ours, ours really range because with Ruby and Oscar I think the youngest kids are what about a year or so old um, and then the other set are a little bit more like two years old um, and then we have some marmosets that are closer to uh, I believe the kind of 10-12 year mark um, so it can really vary um, in the wild of course some, sometimes they'll live shorter lives because if they are um, hunted common marmosets um, aren't registered as an endangered species um, unfortunately when we get them from the pet trade they're being bred here in the UK which means no they're not being smuggled from, um, from their natural habitat and depleting their numbers but unfortunately they're just being bred here in the UK and sold on into the pet trade. Um, um, and people often think as well that we know from the pet trade people are often quite surprised when their monkeys come here and are rehabilitated into groups and that we still have them a few years later because they're told by breeders and dealers that they only live for a couple of years like a hamster um, so they are much more long-lived than people realize yeah absolutely and we see it all the time that people are just fed the wrong information by breeders um, sometimes it's about what species they have how long they're going to live and of course what they eat um, breeders often say that they'll live, they can live on their own because they're going to be your best friend, um, you as the owner, that they don't have a special diet. Unfortunately, people are just fed lots and lots of lies, which make people think that they're going to make really good pets, when sadly we know that is not the case. And it's really tragic that both these guys who end up having to um, be rehomed and having those couple of years of their life living in the wrong conditions, but also for the members of the public who wanted to have a pet that they could love and look after properly, most people don't buy an animal and intend to mistreat it. Um, it it's just kind of misinformation um, and a bit of misguided kind of love and affection, sadly, that, that ends up um, with these guys coming to live with us here at the park. 
we're getting to the end of them now. Lisa's asked who are the new ones. Lisa, if you mean the ones we showed going outside at the end of our pet trade video the other day, that is, we did rescue three just recently, a little while ago. There will be more information about them in the next Ape Rescue Chronicle for adoptive parents. Um, and they will be on the next series of Monkey Life as well. Of course, Monkey Life is on at the moment. Series 13 is on and series 14 is being filmed. So it will be shown on that. Uh, Kerry wants to know what are their natural predators? Ah, what are their natural predators? That's a really good question, Kerry. So for marmosets, they are quite small. So there's a lot of animals that are quite a bit bigger than them in South American forest. Um, so things like snakes or birds of prey um, would quite happily um, have a marmoset for their lunch. Um, they are, of course, much safer when they're up in the trees but down on the ground level you've got some bigger predators like jaguars and ocelots um, that would also quite happily uh, eat a marmoset because they're carnivores and it would be animal prey for them um, but um, we had a question about them being so quick it's one of the ways that they can help hopefully try and keep themselves safe to quickly make sure that they can get up higher or get away from a predator um, so yeah that's a fabulous question great and then one more jen wants to know what is the average size of a marmoset so the average size of a marmoset. Um, Should we go back to Ruby and Oscar while we're talking about yeah, that? Because they're quite good examples. Because when we talk about sizes, there's some differences in Ruby and Oscar's family. Hopefully we'll be able to spot them. Um, so they're going to come outside and say hello to us, are they? Well, they've all vanished. They've all vanished. We could see if we could see them inside. Yeah, so um, Ruby and Oscar are, a, are one of our pairs and Ruby is probably the biggest marmoset that we have and Oscar is probably the smallest, whereas the kids, I suppose, are probably a bit more of the average size. Um, so from their noses um, to... They're, <laughs> they're all gathered here, having a little, <laughs> all the kids are here saying hello, which is very sweet. Uh, so you've got uh, one more just above you as well in the tunnel. Oh. So everybody's just all gathered round. Um, so in terms of length, um, from their noses kind of to the end of their body, not including their tail, is maybe up to about 30 centimetres. Um, so I often compare them to about the size of a, of a grey squirrel when people are thinking about how big they are. But their tail length can really vary as well. Um, so some are probably more to like 40, 45 centimetres long, including their tails. And some may be a little bit shorter, closer to 30 centimetres in total. Um, Oscar in this group, dad to the kids, is actually one of our marmosets um, whose tail has been mostly amputated. So he's very, very short and squat um, compared to Ruby. Um, it was about 650 grams, I think, when we rescued her. She was absolutely huge compared to some of our other marmosets. Um, and of course, some of them do come to us from the pet trade, very overweight or very underweight as well, depending on what their diet um, has been like and how they've been kept. Um, but yeah, it's, I, I'll, again, I'll have to ask the primate care staff if they can ever actually manage to get a good reading on how long a marmoset is, if they could actually ever really fully measure them and know anyone's exact length. Because I think that would be quite a feat if they managed to get them still for long enough to measure them through the fence. All right, so we're just almost... I'm being very careful here, guys, and I've got the, my arm out at length, so when I'm filming through, I'm not stood very close to them. I can try and film through much a little bit. No, it's not going to concentrate on it. We're, but we're pretty much at the end of our questions now. Um, Annie, anything else we should be mentioning or thinking about, do you think? So, what haven't we run over? I'm look at my worksheet and just remind myself what I've put on here. So, have a think about what we've talked about today. I've got pulled up a little fact sheet for you to give you the basic information about marmosets and hopefully you've learned a little bit more uh, from our little lesson here today. So you've got your brief uh, to build a new marmoset enclosure at Monkey World to design a plan. Um, so we want it to make sure it's got an inside area with two rooms so they can be separate, the keepers can separate them off if they want to. It needs heating and lighting, we talked about it being really warm in there. It's really important that these monkeys have nice warm inside spaces to go to. We want an, a safe outside enclosure. So remember I talked about how big the mesh is uh, on the enclosure so they can't uh, manage to get out. We want tunnels so they can go from outside to inside and vice versa. And think about our keepers as well, because if you're looking after monkeys at Monkey World, you need to be able to get in to, uh, to put food in, to put bedding in, to clean the enclosures. So you've got to think about how those keepers are going to get in as well. And of course, if you're building one at Monkey World, ideally you want the public to be able to come and see them and enjoy them and learn about them as well. So think about how the public are going to see them 
and also what information would you put up about the marmosets if you were designing an enclosure um, so people could learn more about them, how they live in the wild and as a species, but also why are they here at Monkey World? Why have they had to be rescued? How would you educate people about what it is that we do and why they've come to some of the pet trade? Um, so I think other than that, like Charlie said, um, adults, please do have a look on our website at the public consultation. There's a link on our website, but you'll be able to find it through Google as well. Um, we'd really appreciate as many of you having your say on primates as pets. It's a really, um, it's, exci it's an exciting time for us. Um, yeah, we remain very hopeful um, that the future is going to look brighter for these small monkeys in the UK. So please do have a little look um, at that. Go on our website or our Facebook page um, to get the worksheets. We've got the, the education packs and workbooks as well. Um, on the learning resources page of our website, we've still got the home education course up there. Oh, and if you are um, a school, or if you're a teacher, if you're a youth group leader, um, drop me an email at education at monkeyworld.org if you're interested in a virtual tour, um, a lesson or a talk from us here at the park. Um, we can do them live, we can pre-record them for you and send them over. So if you want more information on how you can book a session with us, um, drop me an email because we'd love to get involved with you even though we can't get you here at the park or come out to your schools and things at the moment. Um, yeah, we'd love to speak to you still. Wonderful. Well, I think Annie has talked non-stop. I'm not quite sure how she managed to get all that information <laughs> from her head out to us all in one go. I'm very impressed and think I might make her do a lot more of these live <laughs> tours, actually. Um, so thank you very much to Annie. If everyone could just send a little likes, if they liked it, that'd be great. Um, yeah, echoing everything Annie said, that's brilliant. If you can all go on and support us in that way, that'd be amazing. Another thing you can do, we know that lots of you are sending stars, they're sending donations through Amazon Wishlist, they're sending physical monetary donations as well, which we're really appreciative of and are amazing. If you can't do any of those, which we know people can't at the moment, it is it's a tough time, please do think about liking and sharing these videos as well. I know it's a bit of a cliche, but it does help get our message out there as well. And it does help spread our word and spread our fundraising around. So it really, really, all that support, even if you don't want to comment, if you want to just quietly watch, if you please could like and share, it doesn't mean to, doesn't hopefully do too much to you, but it does really, really help us um, at the park here. So we would really appreciate that. Right. We'll leave you go now. Um, thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much, guys. It's been lovely to talk to you all virtually. <laughs>